My name is Kelsey Mullen, and I'm the Director of, Pres uh, Director of Education rather, for the Providence Preservation Society, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our program tonight. Before we get underway, we want to acknowledge that the Providence Preservation Society is situated and works upon the ancestral and unceded lands of the Narragansett Nation. This acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place, the continued existence of Indigenous people, and PPS's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. We have made it to about the midway point of this year's Providence Symposium. Um, and this year's symposium explores the systems and inequities that have shaped our built environment and the communities that inhabit them. Uh, this symposium came together um, through a lot of thinking and reflection that we've been doing uh, over the last year and then some. Um, it's certainly never been more important to recognize uh, and reflect on whose places have historically been prioritized and to recognize what needs to change moving forward. This year's interdisciplinary approach gives us a good framework um, for thinking about how the intertwined nature of some of these issues um, build upon one another, issues such as climate, housing, design, transportation, reflective diversity, and historic preservation, and gives us some idea, points in the direction at least, of some possible solutions. The preservation is uh, experiencing what some call a relevancy crisis, and uh, we must reorient ourselves around the questions that people care about in order to affect meaningful change in our neighborhoods and cities. We hope you'll join us for the next uh, program as part of the symposium tomorrow. Uh, we are um, using our traditional bite-sized preservation uh, format to uh, bring together the director of sustainability for the city of Providence and a member of the racial and environmental justice committee working here. Together, they put together a climate justice plan for the city, which has been in effect for about a year. And we'll be talking about how preservation can intersect with that work. We also want to thank our many generous sponsors for supporting this year's symposium. Um, and in particular to our partners in preservation, our year round supporters, including Residential Properties, Brown University, Kite Architects and LLB Architects who support our programs year round and especially this program. So tonight's guest um, is one that we are very excited about, uh, Instagram is an amazing place as we all know, um, and one in which beautiful photo photographs and compelling narrative drive engagement. It seems preservation organizations have just started to learn how to harness this power in the last three to five years or so. Um, and it's there that we learned about Gerald Cooper. His online presence, uh, Hood Century, presents captivating photographs that connect new audiences to their built environment. And what's groundbreaking about his approach is that he blends hip hop culture and preservation, examining how preservation and loss affect communities. And uh, let it be said, he also has a wicked eye for great design. Hood Century offers us a glimpse of what preservation might become and is already becoming in some cases in its ne next iteration. Gerald invites us to imagine a preservation that is more representative, uh, relevant, digital, and inclusive, inclusive of the places that matter to more people. By centering marginalized voices and forgotten buildings, this really is preservation by and for the people. And many would say that's the direction the field needs to go if we want to survive another century. So Gerald will speak for about 40 minutes. Um, and we encourage you to log your thoughts and comments and questions in the chat feature. We will get to as many of those questions as we can at uh, the end of his presentation. Please remember to keep your uh, video and microphone off so Gerald can have the stage. And uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Gerald Cooper. Peace, 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 everyone. I hope everybody is good out there. Look at all of these screen places. If, if everybody is in a, in a place where they could show their face, I would love for to see people's faces, actually. Um, I'm not sure what everybody's doing, but I heard a lot of people are at home. So um, thank you all so much. Hey, everybody. Hey. Cindy, Brent, Kathy, Julia, Kadir, what up? The Z, how you say your name? Zamini, Zamini. You can, you can say, you can, um, Zumalina. Zumalina, that is hot. 
<laughs> who we got? Oh, look, look who we got. Um, my, my team here as well. It's so good to see y'all's faces and thank y'all so much for um, so just like being with us this evening. Um, can y'all hear me like decently? So I'm in I'm in the lobby of my hotel and my hotel um, room internet is just not the best. And so I'm kind of in transition, y'all. So please just uh, bear with me here as I as I chat with y'all uh, from my hotel lobby in San Francisco, um, where uh, I've come. I'm I'm going to be. Uh, I want to chat with y'all and and I want to do more than the. Um, wait save your questions because if you ask me i'd be forgetting my questions that i want to have at the end and so i really want to um treat this more like a discussion so i really think that a lot of the things that we're going to be doing as we get to this next level um is just discussing right like there's there's so much of a circular knowledge base there so in the chat box please put down questions Anything that y'all want, y'all don't understand. Anything that I can go deeper into, um, anything that I, that I can help um, contextualize, uh, please put it there. And I am going to do the same thing as well as I talk. Um, I really appreciate new media um, and the fact that we do have these ways of uh, new ways of communicating. So um, thank you so much for being here. Um, and being with me and sorry i'm a little back backlit uh, but we won't have to worry about that much because i have a beautiful presentation that um uh, my partner in crime nicole uh, has helped me put to, together here as we just talk about and and really look at this next phase of preservation um there seems like a next phase in a lot of different things <laughs> um right now that's happening um and, and this is one where um, I kind of stumbled into this work. I would say backwards, but it's really, you know, I was gallivanting around the world in the entertainment industry, living in London, living um, in New York and LA, but from Cincinnati, Ohio. And, uh, you know, just being so aware of my surroundings um, and my, my family history and my family, my ancestors that were, uh, I was born in 1983. So the, the, the folks say I look, you know, like I'm in my 20s, but I'm 37 years old. And the, the luxury of, of my age was is, is pretty profound in my family because I had uh, my great aunts and my grandmothers, they were all born in the late teens and early 20s. And if you look at uh, Cincinnati, Ohio on the map, and, and, and a, a, a lot of you probably already know, we're on the border, we're a border town. You know, we're literally at the South, right? But we're in, the, we're in, we're in Northern state. And the way that African-Americans, you know, sort of participated in the lifestyle and the lives of Cincinnati and Southern Ohio and since the mid 1700s was really, really interesting to me. And then I got to see the uh, part of the great migration during the, the, uh, the industrial revolution. I, you know, these are my grandma. Uh, grandmother and my aunts who have come from Georgia to uh, Cincinnati. And, um, and, and and so as I'm growing up, I'm sort of noticing these stories and starting to learn a, a tad bit more about, um, you know, myself and, 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 you know, so where we come from in North America and the, the, um, the special place that Cincinnati sort of holds. But long story short, I get to this like, point in my career where it's 2015 and I'm in London and I start to feel that my church, um, which is in the West End of Cincinnati is, is gonna become, I got wake up thinking it was gonna become a beer garden from a, from a bad dream. It was like beer garden is all I kind of had on my mind. And I actually just like ran back to Cincinnati and start working with um, the, pre, the pastor and some of the local uh, folks to try to see if we can, you know, sort of save or preserve or start thinking about this this church in a in a broader context than um, a beer garden. And it's, and lo and behold, um, I didn't, you know, I go back into the entertainment industry and I don't connect with what's happening in the community, and um, and the church is no longer there, 
right now as we speak. It's been replaced um, with a uh, with a soccer stadium of a professional soccer team, and it's actually just like a, a really good space for a stadium, right? It's like a, it actually is a really like great neighborhood for a stadium, um, but the cost are the cost of these things, um, and and really there wasn't any body there to help represent you know the preservation um you know of this place where mlk you know studied and spoke at and um some of the the, the major places and we all know in preservation the connection to um church you know what these church monuments are in the african-american community so i'm gonna say that maybe that moment um 2015 16 all the way up to to now these moments have driven me to be here uh, speaking with y'all uh this evening well at the bottom of last year i i left management uh left talent management i've been working uh for 10 years as a talent booker um as you know all independent as a uh, as a manager, a business manager, and I would even say a creative uh, business manager, um, you know, in the in in the, based out of New York, uh, also working in LA and London. And in the beginning of the work that I did, y'all, it it did it, it did. I always had this knack for social enterprise, and so in my in my my biggest management tenure is this guy named Young Guru, who is Jay Z's audio engineer, um, and and his and his sort of music tech, 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 technological sort of advisor. He performs with Jay-Z everywhere he goes. Um, and he's always just really guided Jay-Z on what, you know, audio tools to use um, throughout his illustrious career. And so I, I always, we, me, me and Guru always thought it would be great to connect how music production and the knowledge of music production for um, kids in hip hop in the last 30 to 50 years, um, then their knowledge in like technology has come from music production. So I'll say that again. In the last 30 to 50 years, most African-American brown males knowledge, uh, inner city knowledge of technology comes from them producing music or, or you know, being in this pursuit of pop, you know, stardom as a rapper or an entertainer. And so I instantly took, me and Guru instantly took that and we, we took that to Boston University, MIT and said, you know, we know for a fact that mute, that, the, that there, we, everybody was talking about this digital divide, right? We know a fact that technology can actually be adopted through music production and the skills could be transferred. So we can set up transferable skills to get these kids that would normally just be making music or, you know, as a hobby and get them, you know, over at IBM, you know, coding because, you know, these, these kids would spend 20 hours a week on the computer. I frame that up for y'all because um, that's the way I think about social enterprise. And that's how I think about education is I, I, I love taking what is native to people and even what vibrates highest to people and seeing if there's a point in connection, which there usually is, um, into you know a thing that you're doing or some sort of a form of education uh, or, or anything. And so this is my genesis in social enterprise. And I'm saying, you know, there's something there, but, but y'all, I went right back to entertainment and I, and I continue to make music and I'm thinking I'm like really happy about it. Um, but in two, but the end of last year, I decided to step back and I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I was sort of, I knew that there was possibilities in the discovery of black identity here in the United States that I could get into, but I just didn't know what, and I, I quite like entertainment. I, I really do like the creativity, um, the travel and the experiences that, that entertainment would prov have provided in my life. So it was like, man, I don't really want to step too far out of there. And so I started to work on a couple of uh, projects. One of them is, uh, I, I can't go without mentioning, it's called Black Archive. And it's a it's a digital sort of how say I would say pop culture driven but sort of image driven archive, um, and it's an online archive, which means 
to us, it's like a collective archive. So basically this young lady gets this, uh, curates these beautiful photos and videos of the 90s, which we know there's a dearth of videos. There's a dearth of moving images in, in, uh, in the black archive, uh, if you will, uh, in our libraries and in our bigger archives of black folks. But I started working on these managing and advising from an art uh, and curates and, and, and an art sort of art director standpoint. And then I, and then that's when I was walking up the street one day, y'all, and I, and I was, I was looking at the homes that I, on the street that I grew up on in my, my mom's neighborhood. And I said, these are, these are mid-century modern. And, and I don't think anybody on this street knows anything about that. And it struck me hard because I re I know, and we all know the biggest asset in these cities, uh, you know, from a monetary standpoint is real estate or these architects, right? Architecture. And it hit me at that moment that there aren't, there isn't a lot of information that, a, that, a, that an African-American or someone who hasn't or not homeowner, or maybe even a first time, a lot of times the first time homeowner, there's a lot of information that they don't have about the places that they live. And that struck me to start the account. That, that struck me to create a way that I can hyper connect the, what I thought it was, a, it was a, a disadvantage. If we look at urban development, I'm sure a lot of y'all are herbalism or sort of understand or know about, um, you know, this, this sort of live civic landscape or the city planning. It was really a difficult thing for this community, African-Americans and brown folks in North America to actually fight, not only fight off gentrification, but right the wrongs of the housing, um, you know, laws that, that, that have become the standard of the United States that I'm sure we all know about. And in that moment, I also became very cynical, y'all, I can't front. There's so much knowledge that I'm reading about city planning there's so much knowledge of, about housing and the horrible ways of the laws that were set up in this country against women, against minorities, and specifically against African American families that were moving north, to, you know, to um, to work in these cities and really help develop these cities. And the cynicalness in the in this in the in the the sort of energy of like, why? Why are why are all these educated people in this in this um, in this field reading some of the same literature that will be is formally called 101 literature to me, where a lot of these things are stated out you know out in the you know on the print you know this is what states like Ohio was doing these are you know Pennsylvania Michigan and the Indiana would adopt some of these laws why wasn't why isn't there an outcry um, based on, because a lot of my friends and family talk about conspiracy and I'm like, bro, it's like literally in the book, you know, on the pages. It's not like, it, it, you know, it, it, it's not crazy, but I thought that um, I've been thinking, y'all, as I started the account, I thought, how can I connect these things closer to the culture um, that they need to be able to connect with? So I just want to walk y'all through um, not only like, you know, how I, you know, sort of how I th thought about creating it, I want to sort of walk out through some of the very basic thoughts in the discovery and in the action of the account. Because I know some of y'all might not even be on Instagram. You're like, what the hell is like, how is this kid doing this thing? So I, I want to be able to show y'all. So I'm going to share my screen here. I'm gonna put this in present mode real quick. Okay, I think I can share it. Let's see, desktop one, yes, share. Allow Zoom to share screen, okay. Oh, I gotta do that in, oh, oh sorry, I gotta do this in preferences. All righty, so it's asking me to quit Zoom and I don't wanna do that. Um, Kate, do you wanna, can you, can we share your screen? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that, just a second. 
See, we had a backup plan, y'all. Always have a plan B. <laughs> Dorothy, how you doing? You can just tell me when to move forward and I'm happy to do that. All right, cool. All right, cool. So I really, I really want to go. I'm gonna turn my um, camera off just so y'all we can pay it. Look at uh look at that. But um stop video. So um we could actually just go, okay. Let's go to uh, page three. Yeah, this is the this is the good part, y'all. So um, you know, my first question, um was you know who who like whose places get preserved and why right you know um i didn't want it i was talking to my friend earlier like i didn't want that to be such a rhetorical question when i asked it um and so if does anybody on the on the call want to answer that question quite honestly um whose places gets preserved and why? Just real quick, anybody? I mean, it's often about power. Whoever has the power to save something, which often is associated with money as well. Thank you for that, Brent. Um, it's, a good, it's a good starting point, y'all, because we, you know, when I wrote that, I was actually in query, right? I was actually like in inside of a a really like I think you know easy to comprehend, but nobody, you know, looking at some of these numbers across the across the country, nobody, we didn't, nope, there wasn't like a whole industry saying there seems to be lopsided you know, you know, things happening. And that's where I want to start y'all. Uh, by the numbers, right? If we look at, you know, cities like, and I'm very familiar with Cincinnati. If we look at Cincinnati's numbers, um, you know, in talking to the Cincinnati Preservation Society there, um, they are drastically uh, underrepresented represented in African-American culture. And I, 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 that, you know, not only is that a problem, but that's the blaring, you know, reality. And the thing that, that we have to sit with is that, you know, we, we've allowed, um, and these organizations are very young. I, I'm just now, I'm just now coming into the understanding of the African American Heritage uh, Organization in this in, in uh, Rhode Island, uh, and I looked at when it started, and I and I think it was in the if I'm not too mistaken, like in the maybe like 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 40 years ago, and 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 Cincinnati Preservation Society starting, you know, in the 60s as well. Um, I want to know that there is studies and that there's, you know, currently ongoing, um, you know, efforts in a lot of the cities um, to, to write these numbers. And I also want to be able to look back at these numbers um, and, and continue to look at why, because, um, you know, <laughs> that's like the big thing is like, why, why are these cultural relics? Um, you know, you know, why are they endangered and why are these numbers? And, 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 and I want to be able to get to that why. I think we like, you know, out of that why comes so much um, progress. I also wanted to like look at uh, cultural preservation. And um, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it, the, 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 my account has started solely within the cultural preservation space. Um, you, you see my account, uh, and this is a this is a photo from the account, uh, which uh, a building, uh, People's Bank building, um, in Lexington, Kentucky, that got tore down um, in 2015. A beautiful uh, modern example of a modernist building. Uh, zigzag roofs are my favorite. 
Um, but you, but you, you look at cultural preservation. So I'm thinking, you know, when I started, um, you know, I wasn't thinking like, let's preserve. I was thinking, let's highlight, let's understand. I think, you know, and you know, the bottom line of preservation is not only the understanding of these relics, but you know, the you know, keeping the understanding of you know alive through um, ways of activating uh, the education and the activating these structures. So when I looked at culture preservation, it says that act, this deliberate act, you know, well-designed methodology uh, of maintaining cultural heritage from the past, uh, and, you know, and that benefits the, the present and future generations. And so this is just like, this is a baseline um, sort of definition as well as intention of what should be happening uh, within the within the culture and again I, I don't have to say this to y'all because um you know i imagine you, all of y'all's tenure you know this is like saying the pledge of allegiance or something so but if i break that down i'm looking at you know deliberate well designed and the maintaining of you know some cultures And the, for the benefit of the the past, you know, the connection to the present and future generations. So if I'm looking at this, and I'm I'm early on when people would would, would hit me on the account on Instagram, and I would say, "Man, this is a, some type of form of preservation." I would always go to historic preservation. I would type it in. I would get the definition, and I would go to cultural preservation. I would get the definition and write it in and as I started more of the work uh, connecting to the specific culture that that I wanted to connect to, which mine was, and I'm and I'm writing this down because I love it. it was 18 to 24. I knew that the 30, I knew that the 30 and up would already rock with how I was going to preserve. Uh, I looked at black um, and brown, more specifically um, black, and I looked at and. Uh, inner cities around the world i wanted to i wanted to like specifically be deliberate and well and design well oiled methodologies to connect one's neighborhood to itself the the luck that i had with this with this uh you know these these um these folks is, is are that they're the most influential Right, so you look at this. Um, you look at eighteen to twenty-four, but you look at probably eighteen to fifty. So you look at this older uh, millennial, and you, and this younger Gen Z, and this culture, which we're calling hip hop culture, is the most influential in the world right now. And that was like unique, right? Because because if I'm looking back at the definition of cultural preservation, this is going to be really easy to do, <laughs> because th this is the most connecting, um, the most popular, you know, what I mean, uh, culture in the in the world. And so that like that that made my 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 job very easy. And um, I wrote this uh, in a piece I just did about the ra the rapid nature that the culture is growing. Like, so if I'm gonna like preserve that culture, work on preserve the culture, working on allowing them to understand their built spaces, the identity around their neighborhoods, the identity that sometimes formed them. And I use this most popular culture, which is hip hop, then I should be able to like, you know, I should really be able to penetrate. Um, and, uh, and the really cool part about that is the cultures that came before. In the black community, you have like rock and roll culture, which at this time was one of the most popular cultures in the world and really helped shape uh, America's identity and music. And there's countless other stories that y'all know to be true. Um, and a lot of Northeast Eastern states know to be true uh, about, you know, African Americans helping build this country. Um, design, music, politics, language. And like we put humor, even though everybody's funny. <laughs> but um, we can go to the next slide. 
Um, so, you know, if I if I really think about, um, you know, which I'm really so happy about, and I, I know that y'all are uh, excited to see what happens with um, some of the new black spaces that are being thought of from some of the historical preservers and architects around the country and, develop, and developers. I'm really excited to see um, that take place, a side note. Um, but um, during, you know, in the Northeast, there was such a, um, th there seems to be such a uh, gateway um, of how the African American was going to, so this like, uh, this sort of almost advanced look at how the African American, uh, especially the intellectual African American free, uh, were going to be be treated in this country. And, and, um, and so I did, I've done like, um, little bits of studies on the on um, Rhode Island's African Americans. And one of the really cool things that was is a, is a constant through line, um, are these um, public built spaces and and obviously these like religious built spaces um but understanding that um that the civil war um and the and the folks out of uh, the free the free africans who set up the school um in in 1803 um in, in rhode island was was it was really interesting to me because of it's uh you don't i mean obviously in 1808 i think ohio becomes a state in maybe like six or seven years. It was so early um, of African-Americans uh, establishing this type of, this type of uh, higher, higher education institution. And there's been many, there's been many like connections over the last, um, I would say over the like the, the movie era of the last like 80 years um, where a lot of stories have been a lot of a lot of sort of access to popular culture has been granted to stories like this. So this is here's my here's like my uh, my preservation and pop culture assessment of some of the African American histories and some of the some of the very sort of seminal um, African American history that Rhode Island has, but also some of the uh, African American history that exists along the Underground Railroad in itself. Um, as well as other uh, major black sites in the United States. So in, in Cincinnati, I just shot this documentary for, uh, you know, this sort of fashion and art magazine that, that does really well in, in you know, establishing um, a voice in the contemporary art scenes um, in, in the United States and Europe. And since, since culture is one of the top you know, conversations and, and really connecting very huge in the zeitgeist of uh, minorities, uh, millennials, Gen Zs. These conversations are being able to be captured uh, around the Underground Railroad and its stories. Um, really, so really seamlessly. Let's take this, let's take this example of um, the John Rankin House and along the Ohio River. Yeah, the site that the Uncle Tom's Cabin was inspired in, and, uh, and, and started, started its sort of journey into becoming the biggest number one seller, or first number one seller in American history. And that's like, that was the pop culture, I call it the pop culture start to the freedom of black folks and the, emancip the soon emancipation that, that happened, I think around six years later. And seeing how pop culture took a story that was that, that was happening, similar to the story of the earliest free African African school, or maybe the first one of its kind uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, or in Rhode Island, uh, I think these I think these stories are are are, are fodder and they're, that are they're sort of like the seeds to um, a greater uh, you know black identity understanding of um, what we're capable of for ourselves as black folks. Uh, before the nation, so you understand that as well. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, so, I so this is like this is like really great. Know your hood is is one of my my favorite things, and so um, in conversations, y'all, that I've been having, I really want to help start, and I would damn, I, I need y'all help in starting a a, a campaign around. Um, 
knowing your hood, knowing where you come from, and allowing this campaign to be content, as contemporary uh, as possible. We're actually going to be, we're actually going to start it doing uh, a bit of the campaign, which I'll share with y'all um, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and then potentially for LA Conservatory as well. Um, but but the the visual identity of one's of one's um, neighborhood in order to turn it around and allow them to understand and learn the architecture uh, or the culture within that neighborhood is, it, it, I don't think it's going to be challenged. Okay, you can go to the next slide. You can go to the next one as well. So this is my favorite thing. So when I think about how uh, entertainment, pop culture can be used uh, to actually get money <laughs> and help further direction um, and strategy uh, within preservation. I really look towards circular design at being a part of that really good mix. So for all of y'all who's scratching your head, like, bro, how, you know, how, how does this connect? How does popularizing this or understanding the, the connections to pop culture and preservation really help. And so let me, let's talk about circular design. And if anybody wants to jump in on this, maybe have any questions, uh, please, you know, feel free to do that. So this is just like a very early example of circular design and how it can, how this design process methodology can help with generating income and also furthering influence within um, historical preservation and heritage. So, First off and foremost, does everybody want to know, like this merchandising or any of these uh, events or causes that generate money, generate sort of promotion of these, of, of a building, as a place or something, portions of the fund always go back to the actual entity. Um, the design progress uh, process starts uh, with developing ways to empower and improve the direct community, right? And so they're not, these things are not always like just a t-shirt. Um, I just released a couple of weeks ago flashcards that are of the 16 modern styles. A lot of the buildings that I chose were buildings in urban neighborhoods that I wanted kids to be able to identify with. And I say kids, y'all know what I mean, young adults and everybody. I wanted to be able to identify with buildings in their neighborhood via these flashcards of the 16 modern styles. And so, you know, a lot of the things that we can help or, or drive promotion are very popular narratives. Um, and so don't forget about that. There may have been a, a jazz story or there may, there may be um, some other heritage moment that happened um, that people might want to relive and give their money that way um, to the pr preservation of these entities. Um, and there may be, there most likely are people who actually do a really great job at you know, developing creative ideas and strategies to talk to these communities as well. Um, and then, you know, one of my favorite ones is, is um, the sustainability aspect of, you know, how we source, not only from our vendor standpoint, and, and, you know, focusing on natural materials or sort of being in this space of like under, understanding the places where preservation benefits, not only the people, but the community um, and the nature around it. There's this like, uh, there's this, there's a narrative that a lot of people that would, oops, a lot of people that would be um, in the space of preserving haven't, um, uh, let me just, um, a lot of people that would be in the, the, the the position to help preserve, haven't thought about how to sustain some of this preservation and haven't thought about um, the creation or the source materials being in or around this, this, uh, these, these places in order to help the economy of these places as well. And then, you know, the, the fourth thing is the, is the community aspect. Uh, and that's preservation societies as well as individuals and people who are helping with this strategy, supporting the local businesses, boutiques and establishments, all, like these plat these local platforms that are, out, that are either directly or indirectly helping benefit um, the, the, the actual neighborhood. And I say indirectly or directly because a lot of pop culture is aspirational and a lot of the local is just local, right? 
once you once we actually establish a very local presence and I, I really wanted us like in some of my early work right now uh, in partnership with uh, some of the great people in Indianapolis is like Madam C.J. Walker was a popular culture figure. And that is the reason why that's one of the reasons why there is even an inkling of under uh, of allowing her to be preserved. Also, the fact that she like get you know she was rich as hell and you know really benefited and helped the actual city. Uh, but but the forward really matters, you know. And so, how do we work with the entertainment community? How do we work with the events community and the creative community um, that that are now making this present part of the preservation? Uh, how do we work with them in a circular design model to bring back uh, things that are relevant to them in order to help fundraise and develop capital, uh, you know, for our preservation societies, but really mostly for this amazing preservation work that we get to do on the ground. One of those examples I'll show y'all really quickly as we're rolling up on 35 minutes um, is the preservation collection. Um, simple as that, right? Like taking Either, either homes, built structures, events, things that were native to your community or native to African Americans, nation, you know, nationwide or some sort of derivative from from your region, um, allowing there to be some sort of like representation from you know amazing artists, uh, well known uh, designers, not from your community. We can go to the next page. Or that looks like the last slide. Oops. Okay, cool. I, I'm actually like. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so, so let's go back to um, let's go back to uh, uh, the idea of the the self and the and the power uh, of history. A lot of, uh, and then I'll I'll let's open it up for questions and uh, and just catch a little vibe real quick. Um, so the, ide the identification of oneself uh, in, the, in the Black diaspora, and especially as it relates to African Americans uh, right now uh, in 2020, heading into 2021, Black identity is going to be, and I know y'all see it and hear it, it's going to be one of the more well-researched and thought about um, and really just you know, there's going to be a lot of energy, I'll tell you, uh, around uh, our brothers and sisters um, who are looking to know more about themselves. And it seems like given the what we know about the definition of cultural preservation and a deliberate nature uh, and a well-intended uh, as, uh, you know, one that we recognize the past the present and understanding where the future is going. I mean, you know, in order for us to really stand behind us being preservers, you know, we not only have to go and help uh, ourselves with uh, my my folks and our friends and family developing an understanding on who they actually are in the context of the Western society as coming over from our, our from you know from a motherland, but we actually deserve it for our to our communities. Uh, because the power of history um, is just that. And if, if there's a power that exists where there's actually been deliberate hiding, there's been act actually from very intelligent groups of, of preservers, and there's been active sort of of the opposite guard of what this preservation is stuff, we're going we're gonna to have, we're going to have to really talk about that really, you know, really, really sternly. And I think that we, obviously a lot of those conversations are, are, are being had. But I like to end it with, I'm really on this mission where we really jump on the backs of our ancestors, African-Americans that have helped build this country um, and surely helped shape this country. Hopping on the back of, of them and writing the popularity and the hard work and the uh, well intent of understanding of ourselves into you know this 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 very clear place where there's such well intention on some of the spaces in our country being preserved. 
I think quickly next week, and I'm saying this as far as my next, is that we need to really have a conversation about the native land in this country and and how we're going to be able to help, again, uncover what has been covered, as well as um, look at some of these very spiritual places that we all know exist on this land that are not being preserved as they, as they should as well. Thank you so much for sharing this time with me. I wish I could have had this talk in my room um, and I wish I could have had this talk literally with y'all, honestly. Um, I want to let y'all know that I'm here um, always Instagram or email to chat with any of y'all. And I really want to be able to do that and connect with y'all. Uh, thank y'all so much uh, to, to Kelsey and Kate for, for allowing me to, to do this. And um, I'm going to um, see if I can. I'm going to mute and take any questions as well as start my video again. All right. Well, thanks, Coop. Um, you certainly uh, have had quite a journey and are pulling together ideas from about 25 different directions, which um, is invigorating, you know, in a field that has sort of relied on pretty um, tried and true tropes and ideas and wells of creativity to hear um, sort of a broader perspective on, on where you are seeing connections, I think is a good start. Um, I wanted, uh, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to check out um, the Instagram account. The images are gorgeous. Um, and you, your account now has, you know, almost 30,000 followers. I'll kick us off with sort of a, a first question. Um, your earliest posts you started, you, you, you know, turn to your own advice to know your hood. You started with images in Cincinnati. Um, since the earliest days of the account, which started about a year ago, um, you have explored and featured images from all around the world and across the country. Um, how, how did that shift go for you from going from sort of a place that was very personal and familiar to you to shifting your lens out to a broader uh, scope? Yeah, you know what's crazy is that I've literally been living around the world for so long. And so I I started in Cincinnati. Uh, it, it wasn't quite linear because I, I, I am just rooted in Cincinnati and I am Cincinnati every, everywhere I go and every day. But I traveled my whole life and that, that really created the, the, the access to being able to the obsession to see these buildings. So um, I would say that my account is actually a natural progression of, of my life. Um, we've got an audience question that sort of builds on that. Are there sites um, that you wished were preserved where you grew up in Cincinnati that are gone or are, you know, uh, not, um, not preserved to the level that they should be? hundred percent. So first of all, I didn't, I failed to mention this, but um, there's tons of great of the, of the seminal city planning, urban, urbanism and urban studies that come out of Cincinnati from the University of Ohio State and the University of, um, of Cincinnati, just FYI all. And it's really fascinating because the Cincinnati um, Public Housing Authority was the first in the nation. It was the, the seminal one. Uh, before Chicago, before the, the deal. So Cincinnati has this very early um, history there. Yes, uh, Kenyon Bar is a neighborhood that is a part of the West End in Cincinnati where um, in North America, 1907, um, there was a study that said it was the worst place for a Negro to live in North America. It was the right, right across the river from the South. So, and it was literally like right up on the river as if, if you fall in the water, you could go back to the South, to slavery. And, but it was our home and um, little Africa as well. Little Africa was a shanty town. So I can imagine there's just no thought of saving that, but it was where some of the first Africans in, you know, during the 1619, the 17, middle of 1700s uh, settled as the migration of uh, over to Ohio. So those two places, um, which I'm gonna start working with some preservation on Kenyan Bar because 30,000 plus African-Americans that were bulldozed out of this part of the city during urban renewal in the um, six, fifth, 40s, 50s, 60s. And um, there's just no trace that it, it even happened. 
right now. And it's like just weird. So I'm going to be working on that. Yeah. So I'm curious for a place that where there's no material evidence where you can't see it anymore. Um, and your role as you know the creative director of a highly visual medium. Do you have any initial thoughts about how you might represent that history, how you might activate it and draw it out for people? Yes, yes, yes. So that would have been cool to show, huh? Um, so I have these filters right now on Instagram that take that have, we've taken like sites. Some of the physical sites were never still there, um, and we've just put them as like filters, you know. So had I been in my hotel room, I would have showed y'all. Had I been had some sense, I would have showed y'all some of the like filters of the buildings and the different like places that existed in that time. And I do it, I do it on the Instagram filter for people, for the kids, you know, like for them to sort of understand these buildings were there, these neighborhoods were there. So that's one way I would do it. And um, that's like, so for part of my West End, you know, there's just like people's first time seeing these buildings nationwide, or even I put like a plan, like a city plan of the entire neighborhood as like an AR that's like, kind of in there around you. Um, and these are some of the ways that I, I look to connect um, just even some of that initial awareness, right? Because it's not necessarily that everybody needs to know all the information at first, you know? Some kids are just like putting it up because they think it's cool, right? And then their friends are asking, what you know about Cincinnati or what's that or, you know? Um, so that's one way I would do it. Thank you for asking that, that's a good question. Yeah, and um, we've got a question. You mentioned your flashcards and how that's sort of a new venture, thinking about how um, to fuse the work you've been doing with um, sort of educational strategies um, and what, what comes next? Um, are the flashcards just the beginning of a broader concept? Yeah, I mean, I'm a Montessori kid, y'all, so. <laughs> Me too. Put that out there. You Montessori, Kelsey? Okay, cool. So, my, so it was like Montessori, we were like, you know, touching things and we were visualizing things. So yes, I mean, what we what we're gonna do, and I think what y'all gonna do is figure out a way for people to have fun during the holidays, have fun during the gaming nights at home, have fun, you know, when sharing information about the city or the movements. And so yes, we have tons of stuff that's gonna come out, Kelsey, that is kind of like flashcards. I wanna have the flashcards for every city. Right. So you, you'll be able to know architecture from the city, modern architecture. In y'all's case, you know, what I mean, like, you know, other other types of architecture or cultural facts that 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 are prevalent in your city, but that look good and that are connected to research of who those things are going to, you know, because my flashcards, they look like some kid drew them. They look like a, a very like fun exercise that you would put on your coffee table. Like we don't need to just do these things and it just looks, you know, academic. Academic, everybody on this panel know that no matter all of the academics on this panel, including myself, we want to be able to learn in different ways in different environments. And so I come from the home of liberal arts colleges, Ohio. And I look to Kelsey, work my ass off at understanding these cultures that I want to talk to, even if I'm not one, to then have some sort of merchandising that they can play with or be with in, in, in connection to education, cultural, cultural. And um, so, yeah. We've got another audience question. Um, for communities of color, what in your opinion is the next step after preservation in the design field? Oh, in the design field, uh, one of the things that I I gotta I gotta be able to talk to y'all again. <laughs> I want to talk to y'all again. I want to keep this conversation going for real, because me learning about these built so you learn about built spaces. I think is this preservation thing that they just said that we're in now, which is like gonna you know it's gonna be ongoing obviously. And it's gonna start now really heavy. You'll start to see when black identity is at quest and is in query. Then you have this like, all right, build spaces where were we, right? You know, and so you're gonna see this growth. And I really think you're gonna to start to see new black spaces. And we've heard this. I imagine we've all heard about these new. What, what does it look like when a black person builds a space like, like an intention for a black person, or you know, Mexican American or 
builds a, a space for a Mexican American, right? What does these spaces culturally look like when we start to democratize the architecture and the lived space and this experience? That's, I think, something that's going to be sort of a, a big thing that I can't wait to see. I also can't wait to see some of the sheer facts and numbers around the oppression and what we can do to right those, because I think those, those are going to be starting points when it comes to funding, grants, real conversations about how we're going to be investing back into these communities and how we're going to, how are we going to keep these communities. I think there may, I think there may be a gentrification law on the rise, maybe give it about five, 10 years. I, I think there may be some more consideration as these cities sort of lose some of their business element and now need to become communities again. And it needs to be commerce at, a, at some sort of like communicative level. Maybe, you know, maybe there's sort of start to be some legislation in some cities or in states around, um, you know, heritage and gentrification, things like this. And maybe we have something to do with that. I would hope so. That's actually a great segue to another audience question. Um, certainly, uh, preservation has uh, been associated with um, gentrification and displacement of vulnerable communities and communities of color. Um, and uh, it, it has created in many cases sort of an us and them dynamic um, where uh, there is real resentment of sort of the preservation movement for um, displacing various communities and gentrifying spaces. So this question um, sort of drives at the heart of how, how might you recommend that we engage, we, I think it means sort of the preservation community, engage with Black neighborhoods to move forward and find common ground where we all understand the value of preserving these connections to the past. Uh, can you say like the end part really quickly? Yeah, so, so I, think, I think the question is asking, you know, how might we um, as preservationists, as the preservation field, how might we engage with black neighborhoods um, to move forward together and sort of get on the same page um, about the value of preserving connections to the past when there has been this very tense and um, not, and, and it's sometimes hostile relationship between the preservation movement and black and brown communities. That's a good question. You know, um, the, the first thing that comes to my mind because I haven't thought about that. So I don't claim to be an expert at that, but my, my gut really tells me that there are, in, our, in my research, I always find, like, you know, as I'm thinking I'm doing something unique with Hood Century, I always find other Hood Centuries that they, that they were just kind of existing and that were doing their thing, really passionate, people discovering great knowledge about their communities or their culture. I would suggest that there's a lot, there's a tandem of work done with organizations that exist. Like there's these people who just like are obsessed with these neighborhoods, we know, and then obsessed with the cultures. And I think that it starts there. I don't think it, I don't think that, and obviously we all know it starts with dialogue and it's gonna start with a lot of listening. I know it's about the listening part, that as soon as you listen, if there's an intention, you hear stuff. I'll say that again, because because uh, I know we're in a digital age. So as soon as you, if, if, if there's an intention there and people are listening, then you start to hear things. And I think once you start to hear things, as academics around preservation, it'll be easy. It'll be like, it'll be like the craziest easy thing to do. I love, yeah, I remember um, in the 60s and the 70s, I wasn't born, but you would go to these dances, you know, you go to these halls, right? And you know, like going to that hall, you're gonna have a great time. It's gonna be decorated, everybody gonna be dressed nice. And preserver, in preserving the 60s and the, let's, let's bring back those energies. Like let's bring back some of the energies that were actually, do, great for cultures that we might have to dig a little bit at, but that, you know, once these, uh, you know, once these cultural things start to connecting to it, my mom will always tell me when I find out something about history, she'll always be like, what you know about that? Basically, that's a black person's way of saying, yo, thank you. You know what I mean? Like, yes, right? So I think we need to have the, a lot more of those moments of discovery with each other through uh, conversation and dialogue.
That is a great point. So I, I can imagine that in this work, it's brought you into contact with a number of other organizations and people um, who share this passion for the built environment who might not have preservation in their official background or title, uh, but are excited about where they live or a particular place. And it's about finding those other folks um, who are already doing similar sorts of work. Um, yeah, and, it's, and, and I would just say also the cultures. You know, we are, let's get into the cultures. Let's really figure out what they're doing outside of preservation, just what the culture is doing. And I, and I think that there's a really e easy tie. And I, and I hope that, that my accounts, not only on Instagram, can grow into, you know, being places where it, Instagram isn't, you know? And um, that's what I try to, or that's what I, that's part of my connection to pop culture is that somebody's watching this popular show and that I'll be able to bring that that image back to their screen and connect and make it connect to them. So I hope that we can also just be a lot of places like on the streets where Instagram where none of this stuff is and, and really start to enjoy our neighborhoods for what they currently are and what they were in the past, you know. Well, I think um, certainly many people I know uh, over the last year as we've been forced to stay put a little bit more are coming to understand and experience their neighborhoods um, and cities and places in a more sort of thorough way. I mean, that's me. That's me. Like I'm one of those. I was running around the world nonstop for the last 15 years, and also just being obsessed with my home, but still just like not stopping to like go back down the street and walk around the corner and go to the local mart and you know go to the trail that you went to when you're a kid, you know. Um, one of my favorite things about this work and on a community level, y'all, is like, it's free. Like seeing a building is free, you know, like walking around a neighborhood is free 99. And so um, a lot of the things I look to do is encourage people to continue, like, like you said, like getting out. I'm doing, I'm in San Francisco right now because I'm going to be leading a modern architecture redlining tour right like sort of where they intersect in this modern context of we know what's going on in san francisco and um and that's why i'm out here you know to just like show that on my instagram and then i'm gonna have a, a flyer like a something that people can actually hang up in their rooms and it's going to be the map and then they'll be able to go and do the self-guided tour themselves that's fantastic we'll have to follow along um now you're about a year into this project, this new project. Um, I'm curious, you know, what, looking back over the last year, what do you wish you'd known when you started Hood Century? Nothing. I'm so glad I know none of this. <laughs> I'm so glad that I knew what I knew. And then I, I, yes, of course, I would have loved to save my church. I mean, now I got all of the connections in the United States for preservation. <laughs> You know, and then I just didn't even know the local guy, you know. Uh, so it's quite ironic how that was, but you know how the universe is. I can't question that, you know. Um, I love everything that I knew, then uh, even my curiosity about the space at all. And then um, I love what I know now, and I'm, and I'm working on this balance of not knowing too much. I want to know just enough about the space, right? Because I want to know, I don't want to like start drifting into this other space. We know how industries get, all industries, you know? And and I want to continue to enjoy nice neighborhoods and not always have this like, man, these, this is just vacation, you know? Um, Cause you know how life could become a drag then, you know? Um, I just want to continue the clarity um, of the origin of the page you know, as things get Hollywood, like I want to continue to be like, we're going to, so one of my favorite things, and it's sort of a next step if any, if we were going to get there, Kelsey, uh, is the 20% of my funds are going to start going to, the initial 20% of my funds of anything that we sell are going to go to um, paying black women's rent. Paying black women's rents and, and black mothers' rents and moreover, working on a, a smaller sort of a smaller sort of program in Cincinnati, well, how to how to have those black women become those black mothers become homeowners, right? Through community and through that circular design that I just showed you there. 
And it's a, it's the biggest thing on my mind because the black women are the pillar and they're the matriarchs of the black family right now. And so um, that's like my next step. And I'm going to be incorporating, I'm going to be partnering with the Cincinnati Preservation Society and National Trust, as well as LA Preservation Society uh, to help me, uh, to help sort of think about Hood Century being a, an example of a program culturally that can start in one city um, that has a lot to do with the information of preservation, right? I don't like, I'm not, a, I didn't study and I don't want to cheap shot anybody because I didn't go to school for preservation. But what I know is learned over the last, you know, two year and then all of this stuff I know intuitively. Um, I want people who go to school for this to lead the movement. Right, I want them to really like be a part of all of our of all of our work. I, I want Hood Century, y'all, to be an illuminator, right? A, like a media platform, a connection platform to the information, because we know that there's an information disconnection. <laughs> Sometimes I hear historical preservation tax tax incentives as myths. Does that make sense? When I hear them. People are saying them as if they're a myth. I Man, I heard that you could, if you have it, but, and I'm like, bro, that's a fact. Like, and could be a reason why somebody actually goes and gets a home. I wanna, I wanna start talking about people who can help you preserve your home that are not on the internet, but that are in the community. I, I want this publication to be just literally giving us all the information around all of the things that are happening in cities like Providence, Cincinnati, not just LA, um, you know, or some of these bigger cities. And so that's my big next step is how do I, how do I become a source creatively as well as just getting out the way and allowing some of this information to collide um, where it should. Well, that is certainly exciting, um, that idea of collision, I think. Um, and certainly, you know, the Preservationists are good at content generation. We, we know how to research oh, and, and put together some paperwork and, um, and get a story down. Uh, it might not be the most accurate story all the time. It might leave out some of the, the key parts of that story, uh, but we, we can do the content generation where, you know, maybe shining a spotlight on that information and connecting it to people is not where we have excelled in the past. And uh, you know, connecting with folks such as yourself and others, who who are able to be that conduit and connect people, get them excited, and connect them with information, uh, could be a, a really productive thing. So before we go, I just want to make sure if there are any other questions um, that they uh, find their way to the chat box. Um, Coop, we had a question around um, sort of growing interest and activism around um, folks of color in architecture. One of our presentations from last week uh, was about trying to grow the number of women architects and architects of color. Um, and whether the question is whether or not you think as we have more black designers and architects, if we'll see a rise um, of engagement with uh, preservation as well. So, so I think preservation is on the rise, especially with this happening, this account and saying, because for some reason it's just a big wall of like, you can't start a preservation inside a side. It's just big sort of myth. But the women architects and the, and the sort of uh, this, this thing that's happening around black identity and design and the contemporary art the black contemporary art movement that y'all all see, it's huge. Um, some of the best names coming out and just get this like, oh man, giving it to us. And so there's obviously a renaissance happening there. And so yeah, the, the design community is growing. There will be uh, more um, black women architects. I think there's some number that's just so low that it's, it's crazy. But I noticed that there's a trend in graduating as an architect and not working at a firm for minorities. So that's a part, that's a, that's a place that needs to be, you know, talked about, right? So you'll see, you know, we're encouraging, we may, let's say we are successful at encouraging, we look at the problem just there. Like, hey, we need you to become an architect. What happens at these firms, 
what is happening at these firms where a lot of minorities are quitting architects, not even going to another firm? There's a, there's a number, I, I'm sure if someone Googles, it's a huge number of that happening. And that their, their strikes are a big, a big problem as well, right? In this pipeline. So I, I do know that there's gonna be uh, some more folks developing and building their spaces. And I do think that we need to be able to, um, you know, support the pipeline and not just some, one this thing that sort of feels like the direct issue. So. Well, thank you. Um, and I think, um, I think we have- You want to be architect? Hey. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Coop, for sharing your time with us, for sharing your story into the preservation movement um, and where you intend to take your energy moving forward. Um, I think we have a lot to learn from your example and certainly hope um, that our paths again uh, soon. Yes, please. Th thank y'all. Please connect with me. Please, uh, let's continue the dialogue uh, and continue to work. And uh, I can't wait to connect with y'all. Put me on all of y'all uh, calls if y'all mind me listening in to some of the uh, work that's happening in Providence. I want to stay abreast with what's going on over there. We will certainly keep you in the loop um, as much as you want to be. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, tomorrow we have two uh, programs as part of our symposium, the first at noon about climate and uh, climate justice and preservation, and the next at 5.30 about transportation justice and how um, pedestrian safety is a matter of um, good, good and bad design and race and class. Um, you can still sign up for tickets on our website, ppsri.org, and we hope to see you tomorrow.